revolutionary. I have managed a meal in between. I didn't manage to eat <laughs> between the one o'clock when we were talking about bereavement. And actually, it was a really profound conversation about loss, the loss of lifestyle and the future you expected. And I found that a really interesting conversation. And now we have um, with me Tabish Khan, who is the art critic for The Londonist. And you've been doing that, we were saying, since 2013? Around then, yes. Around 2013. And uh, and also a writer for FAD. And um, those of you who have known me for a few years now will know that I also write for FAD. And I've um, Mark Westall and I have worked together for quite a lot of years and were together doing the Saatchi exhibition, which I still have the visible scarring from. Anyone ever decides to work for Charles Saatchi, come see me. I'll show you some scars that should put you off for life. He was actually, it wasn't him. <laughs> I can't actually blame him. He was he was all right, actually. He wasn't too bad. Um, you're also a trustee of ArtCan, and I'd like you to talk a bit about that in a while. Um, but the thing I thought we'd kick off with because it's so pertinent, mm -hmm. um, is the column that you write for FAD is called What's Wrong With Art? Yes. And obviously what's wrong with art right now is that there isn't any. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's no physical exhibitions, yeah. Yeah, we haven't got any. So how many exhibitions would you previously, previous to all these lockdowns, how many exhibitions and private views would have you been going to normally in a normal day we wouldn't have normally got you on a screen would we or in ordinary times no and i think evenings were generally when you'd head to private views and you'd often like sometimes do anywhere between like three to sometimes seven or eight in a night because in mayfair for example they're all quite compact i remember a while back i once said i estimate i see a thousand shows a year and so um, I thought I'd better actually do a count one year to see if I'm actually living up to what I'm claiming. So in 2019, which is the last normal full calendar year, I did count how many exhibitions I went to, and it was 1,168. Crikey, crikey. Mm. That is a, that's a lot in just in London. Primarily London. There was a few trips outside, but it was, I would say, at least a 1,000 of those if not more, were London, yeah. And that shows how active an art scene London has. Hmm. Never gonna be short of um, uh, an exhibition to go and see. And would that include like little tiny galleries and the big blockbuster gallery, uh, exhibitions as well? Yes, it's a mix of the two, yeah. Hmm. So, um, for those who don't go to art exhibitions regularly, I think they think of the big blockbusters and think that's a lot, but you have to remember, there's lots of tiny galleries and small shows wherever artists can, make it work yeah they they do like the little pop-ups and then like you were saying the first thursdays that um used to go on and then there was one around dover street wasn't there there was another one there was like a weekend one oh, there, a there were a few i remember there was like mayfair art weekend which still happens and a few others yeah yeah around the weekends as well so that's a lot that's a lot of art you were consuming so when this all kind of happened How's your life changed and what are you doing as an art critic? Mm. What does life look like now? Yeah, well, um, I'm quite fortunate in the sense that I do have a corporate full time job, surprisingly, on top of my other full time job of being an art critic. So that's been ensuring I remain in house and home and keep me fed and watered and all the important things like mortgages that need to be paid. Uh, so the art critic stuff has slowed down a lot. I'm still writing for FAD. Uh, not much for Londonists right now because a lot of the income for publications is advertising led and especially someone like Londonist where a lot of the advertising revenue came from things to do, things to see. Obviously, understandably, that advertising revenue is not coming in. So, And obviously, what can I cover for them in terms of physical London-based exhibitions because no such thing exists. While FAD is a bit more open for in terms of I don't have to focus on London so I've been taking it online picking the online exhibitions to see switching to write about art books primarily as well and you know lots of other things that I can try to see what ways to keep art accessible to everyone even during lockdown yeah so have you the I've noticed 
online there's a lot of programs and courses and such like that i'm sure they've probably already they've always been there I just haven't been aware of them because i've been too busy doing other things but there's also been quite a proliferation of, of books coming out yes because i think it's one of those things that you don't need to uh don't need to be out and about to do right um, i mm. think the same with artists who have been you know discovering social media or they've never really committed to it and now they're like oh i now have the time and space because mm. i'm not out everywhere to do that and to make work as well so i think people are realizing one of the things that can work in lockdown and focusing on those which is great to see yeah have you um do you make art yourself are you an artist yourself i have only ever made one artwork uh for an art can postcard um sale and it sold so hundred yeah raising money for art can it was quite fun actually because it was a, an artwork i made based on all the criticisms i have received as a critic uh, <laughs> there's all the people who said horrible things about me which i always quite enjoy perversely and i wrote them all out on on the postcard crisscrossing all over each other um and so and that sold to an artist so yeah there you go i should think that's quite therapeutic actually i might try that one i think all you should yeah all the things all the horrible things that people say to me someone said to me earlier after the talk on um grief they said um now i've got to think of the phrase they said you don't need to be resilient you oh, i can't remember it now the um it's it's a different thing to um being resilient is you you've just just got to be able to just keep moving on and just not let these things kind of instead of rolling with the punches you've got to be able to kind of sidestep them and reframe them and i think yeah as someone who writes and um teaches and is in that public space we have to be able to <laughs> absorb i have a great t-shirt um that says um i am the daughter of one of the witches you 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 weren't able to burn <laughs> <laughs> or the granddaughter of one of the witches you weren't able to burn and, and yeah holds me in my safe place sure. so do you have a uh, do you have a book inside of you do you have a book of like you said they're all the words that, that people have said to you uh, are other things that you've gathered along the way that could go into a book yeah i think so i think um, at some point i may um do a book and a lot of people might be thinking surely that now's the ideal time to when you're locked in uh but I think I was thinking more along the lines of the kind of that what's wrong with art um, element of kind of pulling together all the things that, you know, you look at the art world from an outsider's perspective. And strangely enough, I do still consider myself an outsider. Um, this kind of outsider's perspective of things that just don't make sense. And you look at it and you go, well, why is that the way it is? And I think it is just a case of things are done the way they've always been done because sometimes nobody challenges it or there are very strong forces keeping it that way because people are invested in doing it a certain way. So you kind of lose, it's, it's strange because art itself is a very dynamic thing. And the thing is always looking at what's happening in society, it's always changing, it's always evolving. But a sort of establishment that keeps art rolling is actually quite averse to change. Yes, um, because money, there's money in there. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So what's wrong with art then? What is what do you think are some of the key things? Because I know I've got my opinions on this. What do you think are some of the key things that's wrong with art from an outsider's perspective? I think from the outsider's perspective is that I don't think people actually know it exists, which sounds very strange when you say, of course, people know art exists. And I think people know the National Gallery exists. Mm. And it has paintings. They may not have gone to it, but they know it exists. But the wider gallery system that supports it, the artists around it, I don't think people know it's out there. Because if you look at the engagement figures about how many people went to see an exhibition in the last 12 months, it's not very high. Like it's well below 50%. And it gets lower if you go into sort of persons of color, it gets even lower there. And you think, can you imagine if you ask somebody like, oh, you know, in the last year, did you watch any TV? Everyone's going to say, of course I watch some TV. Everyone, yeah. everyone watches TV. So everyone does watch TV, but art, it just feels like this thing, either it's seen as too sort of highbrow to engage with, which is nonsense, but people have that sort of barrier to it. So when you think, well, you know, why don't people engage with art 
day to day, week to week, month to month. And I think there is a lot of intimidation about it. You know, people say, oh, if I don't understand it, I won't, you know, I'll look foolish or I think, you know, I don't I don't want to go in there. And I think someone just commented about people being daunted by private galleries. Mm -hmm. And that's true. Like I've been to private galleries where you press a bell and this camera lights up in your face and all you hear is yes. And it's like, uh, wrong number. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's strange. Or you go in and there's someone behind a desk who kind of looks up at you and gives you like a once over and then it goes back mm. to the computer. Mm. It is it, that I, but they, I think they have an inv their vested interest in intimidating you because that means they can charge higher prices. They create the elitist <laughs> model in order to create that rare, that scarcity feeling. And I see that so much on, on the internet now. It's like, you know, come and get it. It's going to be closed in three days kind of thing. And that's that's kind of around that private view model. If you don't get in at the private view, you're going to miss the best pieces. And if you don't know the gallerist and the right people and you haven't schmoozed with the right people, they might not press the button and let you in. And, yeah, that elitist scarcity model keeps people away from the art and you actually want them to be able to get close to it yeah i mean a, a perfect example of that would be say we all know this concept of when a gallery opens and you go see the work for the first time it's called a private view mm. now a lot of private views aren't private so if they aren't private why are they called private views um, the irony being private views at public institutions are often very private and hard to get into. Like a private view at Tate is actually really private, as in you won't get in unless you're on the list. But most commercial galleries, there's no list. Some are, obviously, for managed crowd management reasons. And obviously, COVID did change it. But mm. pre-COVID, there was no restriction. So if, if I was someone and I heard there was a private view and I didn't know art, I'd be like, oh, that's for collectors only and friends i will have to come back another time i can't go at mm. and you think well of course you can anyone can but we... yeah but if you don't know mm. you're just kept on the outside you're made to feel like an outsider aren't you yeah i think so i mean one thing i remember speaking to someone who was a curator in a mayfair gallery which is now closed but he often said that if i ever had an employee who was new to art one of the things we used to do was at lunchtime, I would say, come, we're going to go around some Mayfair galleries. I want you to pretend you have money and I want you to try and buy something and see what happens. And it's true. You go into a Mayfair gallery and if you ask the person behind the desk, you're interested in buying something. That most of the time, they're not even allowed to know what the price is. No. They, they have to get someone else. So if someone else isn't free, they have to give you a card. And it's one of those things where it's like, well... You know, we are, you know, we're, we're not, we're not selling it for you. We're selling it for someone. It doesn't matter if you've got the money, you're not the right person. Cause we need to, I think the word is often place the work we yeah. have to with someone who matters. Cause you hear of um, apocryphal stories about celebrities trying to buy works and being told they can't have them because, you know, <laughs> even though you've got the money, we don't want it with you. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's that thing about, who you stand next to isn't it so it's what exhibitions you get in and who else is in i know i've had that when i've invited people to take part in exhibitions that and if they've been someone who's been quite well known they say oh well who else is in the exhibition because they won't say yes unless they know who else they're going to be in the catalogue with or on the um on the yeah whatever the marketing materials are for that exhibition they want to know that they're in with the right group and then the next level up from that is on their CV is who has bought their work. So therefore then the gallery is managing who actually buys it. So it's on their CV. So they can, it's just about money. It's yeah. just about money. And and what and what's funny is that the, the galleries that are more open about selling to anyone and talking to anyone are often referred to as commercial galleries. And I always feel like what you mean, unlike those great not-for-profits like Gagosia and Hauser and Verth, that no, they make <laughs> loads of money. It's commercial just means you sell. Any gallery that sells is a commercial gallery, despite the fact they hate that word. That's what yeah, you've got a commercial gallery, you've got a museum, haven't you? And 
it's quite a clear distinction. I know I have been um, vilified for saying they're just posh re retailers, but that's what they are. Yes, or as, as an artist I know once said, is like you should feel as intimidated walking into a gallery as you do walking into Superdrug. Exactly. Yeah. It's just a yeah. place to buy things. Yeah, it's just about money and it's just a posh retailer. So, yeah. you know, it's just like walking into Harrods or Fort Lam at Mason. And if you go in there with intent and yeah. um, they are there for you to look at, you know, they positioned themselves so you can look around. So, so that's, that's definitely one thing that it will be interesting to see how that private view, bell on the door situation mm. changes now. Now that they haven't been able to do it. No, it's funny. There's someone in the comments who mentioned about how smartly you're dressed. And I have found that. So I've been to Mayfair galleries most of the time. And I am a very, this is quite a nice shirt, but I dress down a lot. You know, often I'm in hoodie, jeans, trainers. That's me. I walk around galleries and they don't pay me any mind um, unless they actually happen to know me personally, obviously. Uh, but I remember I once, of all things, my day job had me in a meeting in Parliament. And so I was coming from part so I was in a full suit and tie and I went into this gallery and it was strange because I'd been in this gallery many times and they hadn't noticed me really. But then as I went upstairs, I noticed the person on the desk pick up a phone and I, I swear that phone had not rung. Um, <laughs> so, and I thought that's a bit odd. And then I went upstairs and then out from a room that I didn't know existed came someone to talk to me about the work and I was like, who are you and where have you been all the time? <laughs> it's like Mr. Ben. <laughs> Do you remember that? Part? Mr. Ben comes out of the cupboard. Yeah, yeah, I've had that experience. I've had that experience a lot on Bond Street in those galleries in, on Bond Street where um, I, you go up, they've got upstairs and downstairs, haven't they? They've got the basement and they've got the, the upper floors and you can hear them. Um, ringing ahead and um, saying someone's on their way up. So yeah, I mean, I'm intrigued. I wonder what that situ, what how this is this experience of not being able to open. Have they been selling artwork? I mean, they have their private collectors. Um, mm. I wonder how they that has been operating commercially in lockdown. Are you aware of what's been going on commercially? Yeah, I've been hearing some things. I mean, obviously, I can't obviously. Don't name names. <laughs> don't name names. But it's very interesting. Um, like before, the difficulty was actually the middle market. And unfortunately, lockdown has hit that again. So mm. if you're sort of an emerging pop-up space gallery sort of thing, where you've got very little expenses unless when you're showing, it's quite easy. You can kind of hibernate and wait this out, as it were, to some degree, and sell online while you can. But there's low cost to that. So even if sales are poor, you don't have to worry you've got no space to worry about mm. at the high end um it's been it's been fine because a lot of the major collectors are at home with more time to think about what to buy and unfortunately this crisis has only led to greater wealth inequality uh because yeah. in times like these it's actually better for people with a lot of money generally they tend to do better i know like a lot of investment banks, I know people who work in investment banks, hit all their annual targets by September but last year because they thought volatility is good for what we do, right? That, that's how they make money. So for at the top end, I think it's been fine. You know, it hasn't really affected it. But the problem is the kind of middle market of people who are big enough to have a gallery space, so they have to pay rent, but may not have that established collector base. And that's been difficult for them, I think. And um, we saw a lot of them fail previous times. But I mean, I know people have always said that it's difficult and the middle market's falling away, but we always get new galleries. So I don't think it's the be all and end all, but it's just very hard for those who are directly affected. Yeah, that middle echelon is populated by people who are generally very passionate about mm. what they do. So it does attract in a very passionate gallerist who is generally quite invested into a group of artists i've found in my experience the co real contemporary kind of middle ground and they're quite um tied into the art fair cycle as well that's you know that that is an established means of them making a decent living the art fair cycle and of course that's fallen away as well and so it's 
I wonder how the middle, I mean, I know from obviously from what we're experiencing um, as a business, we work with people who are kind of emerging middle and um, edging towards the topper end. Right. And you can see that the, the, the lower end, the artist support pledge has been great. Yes, that's been a, a fabulous initiative for those people who are selling in that 200 under 200 pounds generally market. It was one of the primary reasons why in the when it first started that I was one of the few people who spent more in lockdown than outside of lockdown because I was buying yeah. so many works and I thought these are great I was going to buy loads. Yeah. All space so I'm trying to buy less. <laughs> Yeah, that's. I think that's that comes on everyone, isn't it? How many times have I been in an exhibition trying to sell something to someone? And they go, I don't know where I'm going to put it. I say, I'll come to your home and recurate it if you like. <laughs> I'm happy to come round, Tavish, and recurate for you. Um, we always find a space, but that's great if you. Um, and I know some of the like up to about a thousand pounds selling around the thousand pound mark. They can do some stuff that's around. That would hit under that 200 if they make the size smaller etc etc but then you go into the next bit which is the thousand to probably three and that that was the area that was quite difficult then you go the three to ten fifteen thousand and they that's been fine because as you say those people that market has been quite solid in fact i've got some artists that have done the best year they've ever had right because those people who would invest in spending between five and twenty thousand pounds in an artwork haven't really as you say been badly affected but it's that it's that the fat thousand to three thousand and i wonder um how to help those those artists really in that bit because i think they're the people who have been yeah um badly affected with the loss of the art fairs and the loss of the local like open we're doing art 360 open studios digitally online and i hope lots of them in that bracket will be doing that um but they've lost their open studios and that you know that's an established route to market isn't it yes no i remember it's also that that kind of bizarre world that you talked about at the higher end because i remember talking to a gallery manager who i know really well so i'm not going to name names as well no don't name names but they were saying oh well you know these works are like accessible to more sort of uh early collectors because they're more affordable at like twenty thousand pounds <laughs> and i looked at them and i was like they both know that neither of us can afford twenty thousand pounds of artwork this is clear and she's like as soon as i said it i regretted it and it's like <laughs> who she's used to speaking to mm. the kind of collectors who come in there that is an entry point but the yeah. one sort of the one thousand up that you're talking about mm. that's people who have not inherited wealth or empires these are people who have just got normal day-to-day -day jobs and even if they aren't furloughed and they haven't lost their jobs they're very fortunate in not being affected and there are a lot of people in those buckets even then there's uncertainty as to how long my job is going to last post this so exactly if you're going to make a three thousand pound investment you might want to hold off for now because you're thinking i may not have a job come next year so i need to save up yeah, that anxiety. I think that that bit of the market has been has been hit by anxiety, mm. not by I haven't got any money, but anxiety that I might not have any money and I should probably keep it safe. Yeah. So if that's the bit I we really need to think about how to help that section of the um, and I wonder, you know, what bit's going to open up first and hopefully there's going to be some attention into there is there any kind of rumors any 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 hope that we can offer to that kind of uh section of the uh artist community it is i mean it it, it is tricky in a sense that i don't even know because i think one thing that people got quite burned by was that when in between lockdowns they opened exhibitions then another lockdown happened and yeah. they lost all of their potential time for showing works to people so even when things start to loosen up i think we will see some hesitance because people are thinking are we now in a cycle of opening closing that will continue until we get we get the best of this virus as it were so mm. i'm not sure what will happen i think some artists i know like you said have started making smaller works because they can get into the support pledge mm. and people are more willing to spend less than a thousand pounds online without seeing the work 
Yeah, we've had quite a lot of sales. So we've been doing Artist of the Week, and that's been great. And we've been selling stuff under a under a up to about two thousand. I think is the, about the threshold on that. Um, but Instagram is great for artists, and I really encourage anyone in that um, mm. uh, up to the three thousand pound level to you know with with flexibility um, a bit over, a bit under. Um, <laughs> To, to really um, look at the social media platforms. And the other thing that we've done, and you know, prior to this, like March last year, we, we only did stuff in the real world. We did real life exhibitions, we did real life teaching, etc. And I've been listening, I don't know whether, you, I know you're on it. You're on Clubhouse, aren't you? I know you're on it. I've seen you on there. I know, unfortunately I'm an Android man. <laughs> Hasn't actually got that. <laughs> Yes. You need to get you need to get on Clubhouse, Tavish. <laughs> but there's been a lot of discussion on there um, yeah. about um, social media and Shopify, Etsy, Shopify, and these other platforms that are like massive engines to drive sales. And I think artists should be looking at that kind of stuff now because actually, if I've learned anything, it's take back control, get some control over my destiny. The Grow, make art, try and find a gallery, find a gallery, try and get a gallery that goes to an art fair, tries to get one that's going to grow your career aspiration. You're leaving a lot of that in the hands of somebody else mm. to do for you. And what I have seen is the opportunity, if you are brave enough to take control of some of that and have a go. So we've actually put up an online shop for our members which they'll they'll all be starting to find out about that we've linked to shopify and i will keep that going after lockdown that wasn't in my plan of something that we were going to do but we've done that now poor chris who does all my tech i've had to send her to a quiet room this evening with with a uh espresso martini because she was getting fairly frazzled with it. I was like, okay, you go and lie down now. But, um, you know, dedication, and I understand that artists find that really difficult. That's not the way their brain's wired. But mm. if you want to take control and you want to protect, there she's there. <laughs> You're meant to be in a darkened room, eating, having an espresso martini, get off here. <laughs> but she, she's been working really, really hard on behalf of the artist to try and get this Shopify um, Thing up and running for them because I think taking back a bit of control is the opportunity now and yes. we've still got time and there is money out there have you seen the develop your own creative practice grants from the Arts Council oh yes I have yeah mm. I think you know they close I think the latest round closes in the next couple of days but there is money out there for artists to access go out and find it and take a bit of control back yeah in that mid market and I would add also that the okay, online exhibitions are different to physical exhibitions. Obviously, online studio visits are different to mm. in-person studio visits. But one thing they do do is close the distance. They the do. If your studio visits out in the middle of nowhere, like I visited artist studios that are often in the middle of nowhere, and I know that the thought goes through my mind: Is this the place that I get murdered? Because I don't really know this <laughs> very well. <laughs> You know, I'm in the middle of some industrial estate and there's no one around. And I'm thinking, is this what happens? Is this what happens next? It's the start of every thriller that I've seen that happens, right? So it's great to know that online, it doesn't feel like you're either the time commitment or the personal commitment that you can just have a look and a browse. And it's easy to set up on Zoom or something, isn't it? Just say, there you go, here's a tour of my studio. And exactly exactly we've got them doing we've done a little how to make a how to create and edit a two-minute video mm. and we're giving that out to the artists who are taking part in our open studios and encouraging them to do it not because it's a great thing that, that we need them to do but because it's a great skill for them to learn mm. and as you say it closes the gap it yeah. just gives you a little bit more control you're going to want to do exhibitions of course you are <laughs> oh, that reminded me of my experience at Art Basel. Right. When you said about the murdering, because I, I went out to Art Basel and I obviously had decided to do this a little bit last minute and I couldn't get a hotel room in the middle of Basel. So I, I was like, look, there's a there's a tram. I'll get one near the tram. And I got it at the end of the tram stop where I had to go under a underpass and out into the middle of a field. I honestly thought this was it. 
I, it was over for me. The things we do for art, I, I was foreigners. They were all talking. I did, yeah, it was scary with my little pull along suitcase. <laughs> it was terrifying, terrifying, I tell you. I honestly thought that was it. It was my end of my days. I was going to die in an underpass and Wallander or someone was going to arrive. <laughs> I know he's Norwegian, but I just imagined that it would be some um, Scandinavian detective would come and find me. Well, that always reminds me of um, when you when I visited the Venice Biennale, which I love because you'll be following this map and you're like, there can't be any art down this road. Like there's no one here, down this little side street. It's like in the middle of nowhere, and then you'll spot a little sign. You're like, oh, it's here. And then you go. You have to be really brave to be in this art world, don't you? You've got to be really brave and really resilient to be in this art world. Yeah. I always remember of, um, Art Basel. Was it Art Basel or Art Basel Miami? One of the two, where that thing where two women got into a fight and no one intervened because they thought it was a performance. A performance piece. I remember that. Yeah. So. <laughs> And until one stabbed the other with some scissors, they were like, oh, this blood might be real. Uh, Quick, get a detective. <laughs> and if, any of, any of you, if you or anyone listening has seen the film The Square, where there's a performance yeah. where a man is a acting like a chimp and then he slowly escalates the level of his violence and nobody quite knows whether to intervene or not. <laughs> And I feel like that's that's quite natural in uh, art world where you have no idea. Like I remember in between lockdowns, I was at Zabladovich collection and I ran into a friend who I knew. So I started chatting to her in the exhibition, but there was a performance going on. So we're having a conversation while somebody in a Olaf from Frozen costume dances around us. And we're like, this is pretty normal for the art world. This is this is a Olaf uh, Olaf dancing around you while chatting is the analogy of the art world really isn't it it's like what yeah what what on earth is going to happen next i have found myself in some quite surreal places and experiences that's that's what makes it so engaging that's what makes it so exciting that you never quite know what's going to happen next that for me is is the the wonder and the excitement of this this world that we inhabit and I want some of that back but I don't want all of it back no I feel like it's, it's a strange one where I often say that the reason people hate art is also the reason people love art because the reason a lot of people have that they don't like art is that well anything can be art and there's no definition and nothing's clear there's all this conceptual stuff it does it like does my head in because I like a bit of order but that's what's wonderful about art is that anything can be art. You know, you don't, the barrier to enter art, there are barriers in terms of the structures, but the barriers to being an artist in terms of creating are very small compared to say, making a film or putting on a theater production. You can do it so much easier than any of those because it's just you and material basically. Exactly, uh, you don't actually even need material. It can just be you. Yeah, sorry, yeah, it can just be you. Yeah. It can just be you and the human spirit. And that's I just that's the thing is I hope that we can get the joy back. Mm. The joy back into it. Instead of like having these conversations about the pretentiousness and the barriers and the gatekeepers and you know, the joy is what I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to going to something that's really experiential that I feel kind of immersed in. Mm. I managed one exhibition during the lockdown seven and 25. I can't remember where we are now. <laughs> and it was um, Panter and Hall. Oh yeah. Um, and it was just beautiful. And I immer I just kind of meditated. <laughs> if you, you know, I was just like kind of standing there just smelling the paint. No. And it was just the most amazing. I was like, I realise now it's the it's the experience of the absorption of the materials and everything about it. The the fact that someone, a human being, has spent a long time considering that and creating it and refining it. And yeah, mm. I want to. That's a majesty to stand in front of. And when you see it, also historically. You realise these people are leaving a legacy for the future. Yeah, I think so. And and I was thinking about when you talked about the future, hopefully we don't get it all back. No, I don't want it all back. 
<laughs> I, I said, I said, what do we not want back? And I suppose one of the things that, as much as I love a sort of private view, I got a bit tired of the sort of packed out private views where you can't move and nobody's actually looking at the art. Everyone's just here for free alcohol. Yeah. Uh, and you know that when the when the alcohol runs out because it suddenly starts thinning out, the people <laughs> disappear. Um, I also I went down this weird rabbit hole and I found out that the name for people who try and bag a freebie is a ligger, as in L I G G E R. And I went down this rabbit hole of looking up ligers online and finding out about how they operate and all the things they do. It's just the most bizarre. And it's actually quite sad, actually, because it's these people who don't have a social life and are trying to kind of create their own. So it's quite sad in that sense. In a, on a more sort of broader scale, I'm hoping that things like air miles will go down because I feel like yeah. this kind of constant art fair circus and they're all just jumping around for each other. And I've always wondered at this. Look, don't get me wrong, I'm a journalist and I love a freebie as much as anyone, right? But does the entire London art world journal journalist scene really need to decamp to Miami when Art Basel Miami's on? Like in Miami, they speak English. They have English speaking writers there. Surely you could just ask someone there to cover it. You know? Yeah. And likewise, when all the American journalists come in free, surely you could just ask journalists here to cover yeah. it. I mean, it just feels like that sort of rolling art fair circuit is just constant and it's just always ongoing and I'd like it to not be. Yeah, I felt quite overwhelmed by all of that before we went into lockdown. And the, the beauty of lockdown is that um, I haven't felt overwhelmed in that way. I, you reminded me of a story just going back one step of being in Cork Street mm. at a private view for the gallery that shows all of the sculpture, the sculpture gallery. What one's that? I can't remember the name of it. Waddington? No, no. They had one down in Dorset as well. Mm, can't remember. Um, see, I haven't been out. I haven't been out. I can't remember anything. I can't remember a thing right now. Anyway, this is the one that shows all the sculpture and it was in Cork Street. And this guy came in and I was like chatting to the owner and this guy kind of put his hand through the door and this hand kind of came in like this and it went round like this and it kind of got a glass of champagne and, and it went round and then came back out of the door and I was like, and then he just kind of strolled off down the street. And I was like, what is going? And they were like, oh, we need the bouncer. Where's the bouncer? I was like, really? There are, there are, there are certain. Mesums. It was Messums. Thank you. Yeah, there are certain people on blacklists, I think, of yeah. galleries to like know that they are. Um, they turn up and they get drunk and they're yeah, they're not particularly pleasant people. So yeah, that was just a surreal. It was this. It was like it was like a cat paw that kind of came in and scooped it out. It was very weird. Cool. Um, we have questions. We have we have questions. I the other thing I was just going to say to you is about the, you know, what to, to just conclude our conversation about what you do and you don't miss. I did hear a, an artist saying how difficult they find private views and how they were delighted that they weren't required to go to private views now because they found it so awfully mortifying to be mm. stood in front of their own work and have the gallerist come up and say, here's the artist, would you like to chat to them? And they said it was mortifying and, and humiliating and they just were so glad that they weren't having to do that. Yeah, I mean, I probably shouldn't give, be giving my tricks away on a on a, something that's been live streamed and to artists, but often I would get Go on. the artist and they'd be like, there's that one, here's the art, the galleries would want me to meet the artist and I'd meet the artist and they'd be like, oh yeah, good. And, and it's almost like, what do I say if I don't like the work? Yeah. So my default saying was always, congratulations on the show, because you do have a show and you should be congratulated for such things. And if they should ever ask that, oh, you know, what work resonated most with you? I'd always be like, I haven't had time to look around yet. <laughs> so if anyone meets Tavisha <laughs> for Island View and they are the artist, watch out for those phrases. Yeah. I think you're going to be saved from some of that. I hope that the private view, there's two things I want to see change. One is the private view thing. Mm. And the other thing I want to see change is the whole commission payments and pa patrons um, situation of um, the way the commission works. 
and the patronage of galleries. I think that is ripe for a reconsider how that works, that whole system works. Uh, no, it'd be strange because I imagine some artists who have it are quite enjoy it. Mm. Well, the, patr I, patron, the patronage. I yeah. Think, yeah, because I remember I've met some um, tend to be older artists because obviously they're more established generally. But, you know, they said, oh, you know, I quite like the fact that I almost get like a salary from the art gallery. And that. No, that's the bit that I think should be there. Oh, it should be there. It's right? the bit that it's you give us your work for 17 years and we give you nothing and we might consider putting it on a wall every now and again um, is the bit that I think is wrong yeah. and needs to be addressed. The, the patronage, I think, is the perfect situation. We're actually going to talk to an artist in a couple of weeks who... Um, I've been talking to and has gone down the patronage route and uh, through Patreon and is absolutely doing so well through that. You can do it without a gallery. You mm. can do it on your own. And I know several who have done it. Uh, but I know I think the pat patron, mm. when a gallery takes you on, they, you, they are your patron and they should honour that relationship. Mm. But so often you hear these terrible stories of, you know, I'll say to an artist, oh, I'm going to do this curated exhibition on this. Would you like to say that? They say, well, I can't because my artwork is stashed with this gallery and they've had it for 18 months now. And I don't think they've shown it once. And I think that is a shocking disgrace. It is. I mean, and it's one of those things that if, if artists ever ask me, I always say, make sure you read everything in that contract before you sign anything, because and also consider what what is your alternative if that gallery says oh we're you're exclusive with us and they don't sell anything in like three years you know how, how how do you extricate yourself from that how do you make income outside of that you need a plan because otherwise artists could end up in real hot water that way so that's and that is a shame um well it's wrong isn't it it's it that's preying on the vulnerable and that's ethically wrong yeah. It is ethically wrong. Unfortunately, legally, it's not. They can get away with it sometimes, but yeah. Well, it should be legally wrong as well as ethically wrong. And mm. that's something that, you know, I'm very, I have a little black list of galleries that um, we don't deal with who, uh, you know, we've also had galleries who have done that and then gone bust and you can't get the artwork back because it's gone into the realms of, you know, paying off the debts of the gallery. Yeah. And yeah, so read the contract mm. and actually ask for what you want. Yeah. I think artists have as much responsibility, not quite, they have a responsibility, not as much. They have a responsibility to say what they want. And I think this experience, if nothing more, should make you braver to say what you want and yeah. I mean, what you deserve. Something else I suggest to artists is that if you are looking at working with a gallery, sometimes the best thing to do is obviously look at who is the artist with the gallery and now, thanks to Instagram, you can probably contact them all. Yeah. Have an honest chat and say, look, I'm looking, this gallery's approached me. I just want to know what your experience has been working with them, how you found them, et cetera. No, that's a, that's a great idea mm. to actually, um, yeah, we've done that before, is contact other artists in their stable and find out their experience. Um, you can still have a bad experience, but you know it's an exception rather than the rule. And that's, yeah. you know, that. Unfortunately, they don't have checker trade for galleries. <laughs> Maybe there's a business opportunity there, Tavish. <laughs> well, it's funny that I often get asked these questions. I'm like, I don't actually know what it's like to work with them as an artist. I know how it's to work with them as a writer. But interesting enough, the administration point does come up. And of all things, in my corporate day job, I do deal with energy supplier companies going into administration. So I know how the law works around those things and yes you definitely don't want your stuff left there when it all goes wrong <laughs> no you don't and we have experienced that a couple of times mm. so we've got some questions we love questions mm. so jane cordery says what really engages um tabish to stop and really look at an artist's work when he views so much art all the time normally <laughs> it is tricky because i think people are talking about emails so people send me emails all the time and how does that work and i've got something i think i refer to as the three second rule which is an email has three seconds to make an impact on me if not it gets deleted um and so therefore you know it's it's amazing how many issues that could address that i can't guarantee obviously i want to look at work but you know the amount of people who send me an email about artwork and they don't include any images wait, what why either in the email or as an attachment i'm like you're a visual artist you know it's visual visual than the clue 
And also things like press releases or information about the work where I'm three paragraphs in and I genuinely don't know whether this is painting, sculpture, video. It's all about where the ideas came from and what it's inspired by, but I don't actually know what I'm seeing. You know? So would you like bullet points at the top? Like sculpture, other, price. I'm a big <laughs> bullet point fan. That's probably my corporate background as well. I love <laughs> bullet points, just bullet, all thing. When it's on, you know, what the works will be showing, where, the really basic stuff. Um, there you are. So for, out of the mouth of a mouth of a critic, send bullet points with images. Yes, that's the important thing. Just the important stuff. That's what I mean. Yeah. I mean, if they need to know more, they'll 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 ask. But in terms of seeing things in person, I think a lot of the time it has to do with um, just the immediate image hit that you see, and you go like, "Do I want to find out more about this work, or am I not that interested?" But it also makes a difference about things like, you know, do you have a relationship with the artist? Is the artist there to talk about the work? Do you have a relationship with a gallery who will, you know, talk to you about what the work is? So all of these things do play a factor in it. And the other thing to remember, and I probably shouldn't be admitting the fact that I'm not particularly impar impartial as an art critic, but it's a purely subjective thing, art, right? So I would like to think that the mood I'm in or whether I've eaten before I turn up at a gallery is going to affect is not going to affect how I see things, but it does. I mean, even in things like that aren't subjective. So the example I've used before is that hopefully this never happens to you, Leslie, or anyone watching this talk. But if you have to stand before a judge and get sentenced, you should always get sentenced after lunch. The stats have shown that judges dish out harsher sentences just before lunch and the softest sentences just after lunch. And that's going to keep that, that one just in case. <laughs> <laughs> so if that's something that's quite objective, can you imagine what art's like when it's subjective? Like sometimes you're tired, sometimes you're hungry, sometimes you're not quite with it. And also, it, yeah, it happens. And sometimes you're in a good mood. Um, and that, that determines, and that's how the relationship angle works. So artists I have a relationship with, obviously I'm going to be in a good mood and I'm talking to them because I know them and I know of them. So that helps things, yeah. You know. And that's what PR people do. That's what they specialise in. Yeah. So, what do you like? Because we could send you some treats. <laughs> get him in a, I'll get him in a good mood. <laughs> I like um, anything sweet, right? <laughs> anything sweet, chocolates. <laughs> right, and we'll get his address later. Don't worry. <laughs> we'll put it in the comment bar. And then you can definitely know that you're going to be getting into the um, featured I, I, on. The... When I review a major exhibition, if you think about, say, like the British Museum or National Gallery, they invite me to come in to see it. There is a press view, but they often invite me to come see it before the press view, where I pretty much have the exhibition to myself and you get a nice fat catalogue. And, and I'm not saying they're obviously trying to sway my review, but they know what they're doing, that that's putting you in the right space to get the best experience possible to see an exact exhibition. What you say in the end doesn't, um, obviously they can't control that, but they know they can control certain factors and that's why they do it. Yes. So it is about, it's about the story and the relationship. And we say that a lot. It is like, you know, nothing can surpass having a really good relationship and building that relationship and understanding that human being if you want something from them. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, right, we'll get your address later. We'll be starting to send you goodies. And Jane, bullet you said she's going to feed me. So. She's going to feed you. There you are. <laughs> you're, you're, you are winning, I'm telling you. <laughs> you're winning. I think she's I've got, fed she's, enough during lockdown. <laughs> she's got a great exhibition coming up when we're out of lockdown. So we're going to send you a press release with bullet points and massive boxes of chocolates, and we're going to invite you. It's in Whitstable. You're going to love it. Right. Get, we'll invite you down to the seaside, obviously, before everyone else. Excellent. Won't we, Jane? <laughs> yeah. Watch out for that email. Thank you. Fran says, would you agree the art world needed lockdown to readjust all the levels um, that you and Leslie have discussed? Um, so that's an interesting one. We talk about all the things that will change because of lockdown. And I'm always reminded of there's a quote by the physicist, the Danish physicist, Niels Bohr, who said, Prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. And it always sums up things where people think everything's going to change. 
and then sometimes nothing changes. I mean, that's just the nature of the world. So we're talking about everything will change, but I don't know for sure. So I hope so, Fran, that this has changed things and they will remain permanently changed. So if you look at sort of online versions of physical exhibitions, you know, that the need for that doesn't go away once lockdown's lifted. You know, there are people with accessibility issues. There are people who live far away. You know, I can currently see exhibitions in New York now. I couldn't before. Mm. I couldn't fly over there in a private jet, could I? Uh, so be it's, very bad for the environment. Yeah, we're very, <laughs> you know, and I couldn't even afford it if I wanted to. But, <laughs> so those sorts of things that will, yes, we hope they will continue, that there will be online exhibitions, we hope that everyone will be keen to see people come back and therefore we'll get rid of the snootiness. But I can't say for sure that that's going to happen. So I hope so, Fran. But yeah, not... we all bear a responsibility in that, don't we? We all have to bear a responsibility in the wanting it to change permanently for the better. And therefore, we all have to apply some energy into doing that. We can't hope for it, but hope someone else is going to do it. Yeah. We all have to invest equally yeah. in that outcome. Yeah, good good question, Fran. How do you choose which exhibitions to visit? Um, so this is interesting. So I get invited to loads. So obviously there's that three-second rule I mentioned about yeah. catch my eye. But assuming it's caught my eye, it's added to a very um, – I always refer to it as my art master list, which is very out of date now because of everything that's happened. But it's kind of all the exhibitions that are open split by – uh split by north south east west central london and outside london and every saturday is my day of doing art uh from 10 till 6 as it were and what i'll do sorry my light is flickering i'm just going to adjust the it might be just the plugs come loose i think that's better yes um so i'll pick a quarter of london as it were and i'll say i'm going to pick this area so often it will it will be sometimes roll of the dice because i've just got 10 exhibitions in East London lined up. So I think maybe I should spend Saturday there. Um, so sometimes it is just a case of there's an exhibition that I, I might be interested in, but I just can't make it fit into my day because of where it is. Mm. And some, you know, that's unfortunately, you know, I'm, I'm in Southwest London. Sometimes if it's in like the very North end, like Barnet or Enfield, it's a trek to get to. Yeah, but if you offer him a very large tin of Quality Street or something, he might. <laughs> it may sway the segment. <laughs> yeah. I think Vincent's asking because Vincent is the curator of the Society of Graphic and Fine Art and they have exhibitions at the Mal Gallery and obviously they'd like you to visit. So, yeah. um, the Mal Galleries is nicely, conveniently situated. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we have one from Louisa. You have been invited to select for some open exhibitions and competitions. Having seen a wide range of work, do you feel comfortable selecting from in images and do you have any tips for the artist, I'm presuming? Yes. Yeah, so I have done a lot now, a lot more during lockdown, strangely enough. Um, but I think, you know, if as an artist you ever get an opportunity to be on a selection panel, I would hugely encourage it because then you see what actually happens. And what actually happens is there are loads of entries and the amount of time you have with each is so small that you're thinking, well, I mean, I did the ING discerning eye. Hmm. We had 6,000 works by 2,000 artists to see over the course of two solid days on Zoom from nine till five. Wow. And it were well, nine till six, I think it was. And it was just so intense. And it's just like, Something comes across that everyone's like, no, no, no. It's just like, it is so short. And I think the thing is, on those sorts of selection, it is all in the image. You know, it all really is in the image, the first image. And I would often say, if you want what you think is the strongest image as an artist, I don't think an artist should pick that. And the reason I say that is, as an artist, you're invested in certain works more than others because of the process of creating them and, you know, when you created them. What that means is you're, it's hard for you to step back and say, if I was coming at this blank, which artwork I'd pick. So I'd always ask you to ask some trusted persons to pick what artwork they would submit if they were you. I think that helps. One thing I've seen come up from a few artists is they've got works that aren't visually striking from the off. And that's actually very hard to deal with 
in a submission. So if submissions allow, I've seen some artists do videos where they talk about what the work is, a very short video, obviously, not nothing long, like 30 seconds, minute max. This is what my work is. This is what it represents. Or even just including in the subject line or the artist title what the work is. So, you know, hand created um, ink using natural pigments or something, something that is very distinctly you, because otherwise people just look at it and go, it looks like lots of other works I've seen, but it's not, but they won't notice that. So I think it is very important to make sure you can stand out even if your work isn't visually striking. That's clever. That's mm -hmm. very clever. Using the JPEG um, naming to, to define, to make it stand out a bit more by yeah. giving some more detail. That's clever, Louisa. Write that one down. <laughs> Louisa's work is very striking and it's pencil drawings and you probably saw it and it, I think it was ex, um, selected for the ING. Yeah. So um, it is very striking. But that said, and I really agree with you that the artists aren't always the best ones to pick the artwork to submit. And I get asked a lot mm. for my opinion. And then when I say, oh, well, I think you should put this in, they go, really? Oh, <laughs> and it's because you are detached, you're emotionally detached from it, you're disassociated from mm. the experience of making it. So you can be more objective, thinking about the judges who are going to be looking at it, the way it's going to be looked at, the environment is going to be shown. So no, I absolutely agree. It's. I was talking to someone about a book title earlier, and they said to me, oh, well, do a survey and then send it round. And it's exactly the same thing. T with a book, title is vital. Mm. With artwork, the ones you pick is critical. Mm. And the first one you put in yeah. is critical as well. Be really, make sure you put the best one as the first attachment. Yes, but it's worth noting, you know, when that, especially the ING Discerning Eye one, because it was two solid days, there were moments where I lost focus and the artwork went past and I was like, do I need to ask them to bring it back? I was like, oh no, move on. Because yeah. that's just how it is. So that's why it's important if if you can afford it, obviously, to enter lots of open calls, because you have to pay money, obviously. But if mm. you can afford it, the more you get seen, the more likely it is that someone's going to pick it up. And also, if the judges are judging in person, it's interesting where if I recognize the artist, because even if the name's removed, often you recognize the work, mm. I can say to other people, oh, you definitely want to check out this artist because they're doing X, Y, and Z. And then everyone else pays a bit more closer attention to the work, and then we all go, oh yeah, that is good. So. Yeah, I've had that experience on on panels where I've gone, I don't know this artist, and someone's like, oh, I really know them, and they're really good, and they've done this and this, and you're like, oh, okay, and you start to look a bit closer. So relationship mm. again, isn't it? It's relationship again. Yeah, definitely. That's been absolutely fascinating and brilliant. And I'm very grateful for you spending your evening You're welcome. <laughs> chatting to us. Um, you had plans, Leslie. <laughs> you didn't have plans. I was going to wash my hair. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> yeah, <I don't> think. <laughs> it's been a long day for me. I probably need to go and have a glass of wine, I think. And Chris hopefully has gone back into her cupboard with that espresso martini and Shopify. <laughs> <laughs> She's got to get back on that tomorrow. <laughs> but no, it's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Now, I know Tabish has got a really cool newsletter mm. called Keeping Tabs because I get it. Uh, and it is really brilliant. And I would encourage you, I've put at the bottom a little call for action saying um, visit Tabs where, uh, Tabish's website. Mm -hmm. You can sign up for the newsletter, can't you? Yes, you can. And, it, and I try and make sure... I keep it as varied as possible. So it's not just art recommendations, it's like film, it's articles, it's all sorts, just to make yeah. sure there's something for everyone. Um, yeah, you do food and films and theatre and other things, don't you? Do you know, I think that makes a big difference as well for newsletters. I know one artist who sends a newsletter out and at the bottom has other exhibitions I recommend. Yeah. I think that's great because even if what she's doing currently, you're maybe not so interested in, you look forward to the newsletter because it'll have other things for you too. And yeah, I think it does make a big difference in terms of making sure people click on things or open your newsletter. Yeah, sharing the love. Yeah, definitely. Always encouraging people to share the love. Mm -hmm. No, so sign up for Ta Tabish's newsletter because I highly recommend it. It's very good. Yeah, I, I enjoy getting that in my um, 
inbox and I don't delete it. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> I do delete a lot because you can imagine how many I get, but it is a really it's cool. It's MailChimp. I'd know if you deleted it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I will use MailChimp too. I'm wary of MailChimp now. Mm. No, it's great. I really would encourage people to do that. And I'm really looking forward to bumping into you at some sort of event, not mm. a private view, but an event when things open up. And um, yeah, it's been great. Thank you so much. Absolutely mine mine of really useful information for the artists, lots of tips and everything. I know everyone's really enjoyed it. So we're going to close now because I do need to go and eat some dinner. I don't know about you, but it's a bit like, careful, the mood's going off. <laughs> but no, thanks so much, Tavish. And thank you, everyone who's joined us live or has been on the live stream tonight. It's been absolutely invaluable. Next week, we've got Dr. Um, Matthew Anchory, and he's an Ayurvedic doctor. So that's next Tuesday at one o'clock. Really fascinating. I'm going to be intrigued by what he has to say. And then the week after that, we've got the guy who I was saying about the Patreon, who's been using the Patreon platform. Really interesting. So, no, thank you all so much for coming. This will be up on the website for anyone who um, hasn't been able to watch it live. Thank you for coming and watching it on Catch Up. And make sure you sign up for Tabish's newsletter. <laughs> all right. Night, night. Thank you all. Bye.